everybody, this is Alchemist 2, and I'm back again with another book review. Recently, I read with um, some difficulty <laughs> Micho Kaku's Parallel Worlds, and honestly, I thought that it was really fascinating. And it's broken into three parts, which uh, would be part one, the universe, part two, the multiverse, and then part three, escape into hyperspace. The first part is pretty well um, explained in such a way that you can grasp, except for the the mathematical, the higher mathematical terms, which I had some difficulty understanding because it goes beyond my ken and uh, my um, <coughs> my ability to actually. Um, comprehend this sort of um, perspective, though I, I do get some mathematical understanding out of, out of um, what is presented here. It's just that it's it's um, something that I'm not too familiar with, and uh, uh, if I said that I did understand it, it would make me seem like a genius, and I'm hardly that. Uh, I do understand it at a very... Uh, tiny level at, at the most I think is what I'm really trying to um, <clears throat> convey. The second and third part of the book were um, my favorite in the way that he describes uh, the possibility and probability of different universes and of course M theory which is known as mother theory or mystery or uh, the most basic membrane theory and he he goes on to describe how we're the flatlanders in this world and uh, how we understand everything is only being part of just um, two, two or three dimensions we really don't understand the fourth dimension at all and there are actually eleven dimensions if you can imagine that and I thought what? <laughs> come again? but um Actually, it doesn't surprise me at all because this sort of thing is uh, written of in, in the Bible, which, you know, a lot of people say, really? Hmm. Because uh, there's one part in Revelation where Paul speaks of, no, not Paul, but John. John speaks of having returned from the sixth dimension. And if there's six, well, more than likely there are eleven, and who knows, there could be more than that. But so far, we all we know that there's the magic number of eleven, and in numerology, that's the number of fulfillment. Um, spiritual fulfillment. That's just kind of an aside that I would throw in there because I thought it was intriguing. The the whole I, idea uh, concept of different concepts in this book are are really deep and profound. And the last part speaks of different uh, class classes that uh, like class one, class two, class three, class four societies that can exist within. Um, other universes that we may inhabit and how our world is in the what's known as the Goldilocks zone and how everything else in the orbit produces our um, give and take of life and proliferation and how if things were off just by a smidge of refraction that there wouldn't be anything and, and that's actually very true and, and that would sound serious and kind of um, <laughs> melancholic but it's um, there's a lot of uh, honesty to that statement and just thinking how everything is just so in our world and in our universe and there are other um, incidences of this Goldilocks factor taking place and they're being found each and every day and um, I like to think that our species is capable of time travel and in fact uh, Dr. Kaku speaks of that and it's really fascinating and he talks about how black holes at the end of a black hole would probably be something called a white hole where um, time would be reversed and I thought oh that sounds um, fascinating really and I would like to see one myself someday <laughs> if I don't get chewed up in the process of the gravity yeah I would have you would have to have a, a 
uh, vehicle to avoid the pressurization and I'm not really sure how that would work honestly because you'd have to be pulling it towards you instead of just you know it's just streaking the space ahead of you they, he talks about that and and he describes that in great detail and I, I can't quite put it forth in, in the eloquent um, nature that he does because um, my background is so limited but uh, this sort of thing has always interested me since I was a little girl, and I just think it's it's something that we will probably see in um, the days to come. And who knows? We we might be inhabiting um, a planet called Earth Three in in the future, perhaps. Any number of things is is um, possible or probable through um, theoretical physics and course they talk he talks about how um, M theory itself though it could be the theory of everything doesn't mean that uh, quantum physics um, would be at an end and uh, this is definitely not like reading at all and thank goodness there's a glossary because there are a lot of terms here that I was not at all familiar with like uh, there's uh, something called what is it? Redshift. If I can find it. Let's <clears throat> give me a moment. I'm sorry, it's taking me so long. <laughs> okay, redshift. The reddening or decrease in frequency of light from distant galaxies and due to the Doppler effect indicating that they are moving away from us. Redshift can take place via the expansion of empty space as in the expanding universe. And then you've got something called blue shift, which, uh, let's see if it, here it is, increased frequency of starlight because of Doppler effect. If, Doppler shift. If a yellow star is moving towards you, its light will look slightly bluish. In outer space, blue shifted galaxies are rare. Blue shift can also be created by shrinking the space between two points via gravity or space warps. Of course, it talks about the, the only way you could do that would be through an Einstein Rosen bridge, probably. I think that would be my understanding. It, it would be kind of challenging to do, I think, if you could go fast enough. Uh, da, 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 da. <clears throat> Talks about the <laughs> yeah, there are different. I I like this term here, event horizon, the point of no return surrounding a black hole, often called the horizon. <laughs> is once believed to be a singularity of infinite gravity, but this is shown to be an artifact of the coordinates used to describe it. And then of course it talks about one of my favorite people, uh, Nikola Tesla, when he uh, mm, was mentioning class four, class four uh, civilizations, they would be harnessing the power of, of vacuums. Um, that was really unbelievable. I just thought that was remarkable. I wonder if you could do that though. Hmm. Uh, magnetism maybe could be could be used as a power source because I was thinking about that in this present day and age and why we haven't done it. I don't, I don't I'll never know but um, as far as books are concerned this this one will definitely get your synapses humming so I would highly recommend it and hopefully um, you could get a lot out of it like I did because I just felt that it was really um, a moving book and very inspirational and at no point he al he'd always talks about um, the fact that everything uh, dies even all, all these universes will eventually just become dead space and floating in a um, mass of blackness and no nothingness but um, you know it doesn't really bother me all that much <laughs> honestly because uh, you know, I'd, li I'd like to think that there's something more than just what we have beyond ourselves. And I don't think about the vastness of the universe as depressing or anything. I think of it as just something that's um, really amazing. And it just uh, it gives me hope for 
what what we will find and what we will see in this future and what we have right here right now in our present day and age